I'm Mark Sowerby, welcome to Business News Australia. You've been Chief Entrepreneur now for eight months. What have you found so far? Yeah, so I think the interesting part for me was finding out how much I didn't know it was going on. So, you know, you think through the Blue Sky journey and the venture capital and we're a startup ourselves that um, you'd have a really good sense of everything that was going on and I just had no idea. Like there's 10 times more going on um, at the grassroots than I expected. and. Probably it's not that surprising that it's underground and that people are, are just getting on with doing it and um, and there's no screens to find these deals or these opportunities and so the only way you find them is by being on the ground and then someone says, oh, you should talk to such and such and you know, you walk into their office and go, we've got 60 people here, I don't even know you exist and and uh, and so yeah, there's a lot, a lot going on, a lot of younger people coming through that I think have decided it's a career path. There's my other, like they're you know, thinking about accountancy, law, medicine, um, you know, going to work in stockbroking, and they're thinking entrepreneurship as a. And I think QUT has done a really good job of getting that message out there, and the universities are definitely on the same path. So there's a wave coming through. It's a tsunami, actually. And you mentioned before to me, before we went on air, just about the regional areas. Were you surprised at the response out there? Uh, I mean, look, you know, I'm from the regional area, so I'm always biased. So, you know, they're so friendly and uh, um, and so engaged. And because it's always more challenging being in those areas, then you tend to find there's sort of an underlying, just an entrepreneurial streak that's there. Uh, and But the engagement across those towns was extraordinary and the hospitality, but also there was really high quality uh, ideas that were coming through. and. Um, and each of them had their own flavour, like each town seemed to have its own sort of strengths and, and things that it was interested in. And, um, you know, some like Gundawindi is a cotton area, it's already a big entrepreneurial thing and entrepreneurs are always the same, they want more information and more engagement and more more friendships and, more, and you know, more ideas and so there was just a whole bunch of people who had already done it. They'd done more than most of us had and it was, uh, so it was good and then you go to some other places and it's all, you know, Cairns was... Cairns was just exciting. It was almost like we got there the week that it took off. And yeah. um, we had to move venues four times to get everyone in, still had a hundred that couldn't get in. So it was just a, you know, just great luck. Yeah, and your job, part of your job is to, to get investment, uh, venture capital, how's that going? Yeah, so the first, I guess the first um, piece I was trying to hit was to understand what we've got. Mm. And so the second piece will be around, more around investor education. So, mm. so we're attracting, definitely attracting more people here. The precinct in the city is very attractive for that because it allows them to be based there and see the deals and get those random collisions and opportunities that can come through. Um, there's lots of pitch nights and all those things happening now as well. So it's sort of like a deal flow feed that's coming through. We're not short of deals. Uh, and probably like there's more offshore interest myriad, which we had um, a week and a half ago, had 10 or $15 billion worth of venture capital money there. So it's about sowing that seed and then saying, why don't you come here? Because they know they've got to be on the ground to get the deals. You can't get them by flying and flying out. Like their relationships, their new partners. So, uh, so that's, um, that's still got more work to do. There's still a soft spot there. Mm. And, uh, and mostly, it's not that there's not available capital. It's just that people don't know how to get in and what are the filters they should use. There's an education piece, and that's going to take you know, that's going to take a few years. And do you think the uh, the young community, the startup community, needs to learn a bit more about that? How to attract venture capital? Do you think that's a, a key thing? Uh, no. Yes. Yeah. They will have to learn. Like we all have to learn. That. And um, and raising money and all the things that you do. I think teaching. What we're trying to do is teach the. Um, the younger kids, the rules around that. Are, 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 you, know, you want to get as far along as you can on your own money and and you know your close family and friends because if it's a great filter to stop you just having a punt. And I think you know I've heard a few tech companies around town that have raised some money recently, and they, the young guys and girls, and they've said you know, we raise money at this uh, crazy price, and that's a recipe for disaster because they're not going to meet the expectations of the investors and all those things. And Yes, they might have sold less equity, but they're going to have a problem down the track, and that's going to be probably a business killer. So, you know, always selling shares at a price that you think people are going to make money from is a really good filter, but only when you've got the conviction that you're sure um, that it's going to make it. And the other piece is alignment. You've got to have all, if you're going to, if you've got an idea and you're going to back yourself, you need to have everything you've got in. Everything. So, what do you see the main challenges for budding entrepreneurs right at the moment at the start of this wave? Yeah, so, I mean, it's mostly going to be experience, and I guess it depends on. You know, the assumption always is that the entrepreneurs are young. Um, they're not necessarily always young. They, um, you know, I was 35 when I started with this guy. So I'm not particularly young. It feels young now that I'm 45. Um, but, but, uh, but experience is one thing. And so you want to fill that gap if you can with good investors, um, good board members, um, you know, great mentors, people have done it before. And there's a really good base of people across.
across uh, Queensland that have done that, and they need to really, need to really draw on them to help build for the journey because the rules are the same. It doesn't matter what the industry is, the, the rules are the same. So I think um, and building an ecosystem that supports them and carries them through we can mitigate the risk of failure. Steve Baxter last week said to us, um, we asked him what it was like. To, what would it be like to be an entrepreneur? What it takes to be an entrepreneur? And he said, if you ever get a chance to talk to Mark Sowerby, talk to Mark Sowerby. <laughs> he said he's got a message for entrepreneurs, and one of the things he says is not for the faint-hearted. Can he peg you right on that? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's in the context of my experience, but also we're uniquely positioned with the Blue Sky Journey, where we're a startup ourselves, and that could become a half million dollar company, and then, but we had all these all, all these younger businesses that we invested in, so we sort of saw both sides of the equation. I think it's a quite a unique perspective, and um, you know, it's a, it's a relentless journey, and uh, you know, you need to box yourself in and give yourself no optionality for failure, and. Uh, and just you never know when the pain's going to end, um, and everybody seems to go through. It's typically a decade, and uh, and it's just a journey that you go on. That's the same for everyone, and they experience it in different ways and at different times. It never runs like the spreadsheet, and um, and so you know I think when you're making, you know, the way I'd express it is that when you're making a choice to be a you know, lawyer or accountant or whatever it might be, I think you're really making a career choice. But I think if you choose to be an entrepreneur and start your own business, you're making a life choice because you're doing it for yourself, you're giving yourself a platform to express yourself uh, to the world, you're taking on the world, it relies on you, it's your um, ability and learnings and experience and talent that's going to get you through or not and, and you're exposed but there's sort of something invigorating about being unleashed and, and that sort of attracts a certain style of person but, but there's that side of the excitement of getting started and having your own company and logos and all the things that you do that are all really sexy and then there's the reality of the grind and um, the reality of the risk of partners, the reality of cash flow and the reality of trying to make sales and tell your story and Australia's a big country so there's a lot of travel and it's hard on your body and, and your families and relationships and friendships and that just is what it is. But if you get to the end, you know, if you get the outcome then, you know, then it's just like, like everything in life, the reward has to be worth the risk. What traits do you look for in someone? I mean, you're looking at sort of startups. Mm. What do you look for? What do you see? What do you want to see in someone? Yeah, I think, I mean, really, I like to test the conviction of their, like, a lot of people feel like it's, um, you can tell that they're having a, a punt or that it's because they have to. It's not because they, it's particularly their DNA. So what you're trying to, what we're always trying to test was their, was it, was it their DNA? Was it that they really uh, wanted to do this and had the conviction? So what were the, what were the thick decisions they made along the point to when they got to when they decided they needed capital or something like that? And, and typically the bootstrappers, the ones that fight over multi years, where partners stay together, where they got to know each other well before they did it. Just the things that you would do that are common sense, natural risk mitigators, rather than throw some guys and girls together, let's have a punt, raise some money and see what happens. And if we lose the money, save the year. I mean, I think that's a horrible attitude. And you know, I hate the pivot. Uh, Do you ever sort of tell people, look, this just isn't going to work? Do you ever come across that situation? Yeah, that's what people told us about Blue Sky. So, <laughs> really? Yeah, they're still saying it. Really? I mean, it's incredible to me. Uh, you know, I, I um, so yes, I think you're going to get that all the time. And I, I rarely say that to people. I was, you know, the two words I hated most were sounds good. You know, I just hated that. And uh, I hear it all the time. Mark sounds good. And I'm like, no, no, it is good. And um, so you're always sort of, we're always fighting that. So I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I try not to tell people that something's a bad idea. I'm more interested in the structure. Uh, you know, I did a list for on ABC Radio on the original tour, and, and I was surprised at my answer because the, the, journal, the lady, the reporter asked me my top five things um, for a startup, and I can remember what they were. And the first four were all about personal growth development, testing yourself, values, substance, character, strength, conviction. None of it was about the idea. I was just going to ask you that. If you had two minutes with the startup, would they be the things you, you'd impress upon them? Just that's those things I, you just said? Yeah. That's all I talk to them about. Is the, you know, yeah. I'm trying to give them some sense that you can't. Like human beings are what they are. So I always found, even when I, even within the Blue Sky journey, I would say to, uh, you know, we had a really interesting, highly talented third way to come to our business because we got big enough to attract better people. And, and I would say to them, you know, don't do this because. And they would typically um, still do it anyway. Yeah. And uh, they're like, they're people are like kids, they just want to experience stuff themselves. So finding ways to give people experience and experience those things. If you tell them, they're just going to go, you're yeah, sure. And yeah, I'm with you, don't worry, not really. <laughs> so Isn't then, there an element of letting them learn by their mistakes too? Do you think that's a part of it? You want to avoid that if you can. I'm letting yeah. them learn from a small mistake and see it live and go, okay, now I know what that looks like, I don't want to do that. Because the price is often high. And usually in building a business, you're attacking 
the soft spots to try and you know, it's actually a bit like yourself. You really should rather than focusing on your strengths, actually what you should do is eliminate your weaknesses. And um, if you do that, you get a stronger foundation and you keep growing. Um, and you do that by nipping problems in the bud early. And it's the same as personal development is, is building a business, the rules are the same. And so um, how do you impress upon people that this little thing, you know, I always think five and six scenarios beyond and go, oh my God, that could lead to this, 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 and this. And suddenly I see those people, oh my God, that's blow up risk. I'm going to kill this dead. And so just, I think, you know, trying to teach people those things is, is challenging, but um, the more people they talk to that, and that can show them their experience, hopefully you can get it through them. Uh, you said you'd, you only do this for one year, this job. Would you extend, do you think? No. So I don't need to. Like my job's to, to get it started and structured and the, get the narrative right and pull them together and um, and then there'll be someone that's just more capable than me in this space. And you want to have a different flavour as well along the way. I'm a structure freak so you know I want to get the structures right and the people right and um, and get a good idea of what's out there and then say, okay, here's the areas we should take in the next year. So a business, you know, a bit of a strategy and plan. That's me. Uh, tell, you know, tell the story about Queensland, which I'm really, you know, really proud to do. Um, but no, a year's enough and, uh, you know, I, did, I retired to, to spend time with my boys and I'm not spending enough time with them. So, um, yeah, that holds true. It's just the timing, but it is what it is. Final question for you. Do you have any involvement still with Blue Sky and would you ever consider going back into big business or so-called big business? It's funny, it's funny that you should say that, like, you know, we, Alex McNabb, our CIA, I was talking to the other day, and he said, Mark, um, you know, I was doing a speech the other day, and there was someone before me, and, they, and they, as I was introduced, they said, um, so we've heard from the small end of town, now like you're from the big end of town, which is Blue Sky. When you're a startup, we just laughed and laughed, and was like, we're not the big end of town, and you don't think of yourself, but it is a big business now, you yeah, know, it's, it's going to be yeah, in the yeah, exactly. 200 and it's not a big business in terms of people, though, it's like 95 people or something, right. and so no, there's no chance of me going back in there. Um, I think as the founder, it's a really, you've got to, I did, a lot, I did so much work around this, like you've got it, it's different from a CEO stepping down, uh, when you're the founder, you know, you, there's a great line that, um, that the US investor gave me, he said, Mark, remember as the founder, you, you'll eventually become the most dangerous person in the room, and it's a really interesting comment, and so what happens, and imagine being Rob Shan now, and he's awesome, and they're an awesome group, and, and having me sitting there. Plus, I'd be part-time, and you get part-time decisions. I think I know everything. Uh, there'd be things that I wouldn't want to do. My risk profile's changed. Uh, that's a multi-generational business done right. Like it's a Blackstone-style business, and you've got to choose to go dictatorship or, or multi-generational. And we decided to go, you know, that intergenerational growth. And so, no, I won't go back in there, and uh, I won't need to. Like the reason I could go, you know, you get these inflection points where your business is. And we could see out two and three and four years, and there's always execution risk and things to do. And what's the world going to do? Especially now with all the changes that are happening around the world. But, but really, it's a business that's that's structurally incredibly strong. It's growing at 50% per annum. Uh, everybody thinks they won't do it, and they're going to kill it. And they're an awesome group. Like that's Queensland talent genuinely taking on the world and winning. Uh, so no, I'm really proud of them. I think they're a wonderful group, and they deserve the right to run it. And the last thing they want is, you know, an insane person like me around um, being annoying like I just need to trust them and let them run and, and we kept a lot of our shares and we kept them for a reason one is we want to support them and secondly because it's smart yeah. Mark Selby thanks for your time I appreciate it thanks for coming on Business News Australia you. cheers thanks. thank you